and I did this for a reason. Um, chest pain is pretty straightforward for the most part. There is a lot of, there is some difficulty there, but it's more or less straightforward in that there's a, a limited amount of things that are happening in that area. There's less organs. So there's less to think about in the abdomen. There's a ton of organs. And so things can go, can go on, uh, go wrong with all of those organs. So, um, when you are unsure about something, just think about it logically and we'll walk you through everything. Um, I have a, um, a graduation for my residency program um, around like 1215 that I have to be at. So I'm going to try to be on time. What we're going to do after this is um, uh, it, I'm going to try to end around like uh, 10 o'clock ish. And if you have more questions, uh, we'll have a debrief session later on. We'll figure out the time, what's convenient for other people. And you can think about the case and ask questions there if you want. Okay. All right. So let's get started. So we have a 56-year-old male with a 30-pack year smoking history and hypertension who presents the ER with worsening abdominal pain over the last two weeks. Um, pain is located in the upper abdomen, feels like a pressure and discomfort. Um, it was, it's difficult to eat, but he, and he gets full pretty easily. He has lost 20 pounds over the last month. Um, he has mild nausea throughout the day, and he's able to, but he's able to keep food down when he does eat. He denies any difficulty swallowing um, food or water. So, um, let's see. Dr. Al Hassan, um, in that, in those statements there, in that first kind of paragraph, what, what's important to you? What, what's important to, uh, to, uh, keep note of? Uh, it's, I feel like it's important to keep note that he gets full easily and his weight loss as well as his nausea. And okay. in regards to his history, his hypertension, and also so, the ab pain. Sorry. And sorry, uh, also the what? Uh, the pressure, like abdomen, abdominal pain. Okay, so let's take let's uh, take each of those um, and, and go from there. So the the history, say the, you said the smoking history and the hypertension is important. So why? Mm -hmm. Um, because. In regards to the ab pain, or just like yeah, yeah in, in terms of like his abdominal pain, what does it what does it put him at risk to uh, of? Um, a heart attack or? Um, sorry. So yeah, heart attack is one. Yeah. Um, what else? And am I or no? Uh, what else? What do we What do we typically see? Um, smoking cause in general, not so much in this patient. Um, difficulty breathing. Difficulty breathing. What will kill you? Cancer. Yeah. So smoking can cause cancer everywhere, right? So that's something that you're going to want to keep in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. um, good. So he has a pain in the upper abdomen, feels like pressure and discomfort. Why is that important? Uh, the pressure is a, a type of pain that he's like experiencing is important as well as the fact that it's gone over two weeks. Okay, and so also with the location of the pain. Yeah, so it's upper abdomen. So what can be caused? Mm -hmm. What can be going on with the upper abdomen? Uh, stomach, or it could be. Uh, could be liver, gallbladder, stomach, or yeah, yeah or spleen. Or spleen, or the, the pancreas is also in that area. Too. Pancreas, so, yeah. yeah, so all of those things you're going to keep in the back of your mind um, and, and kind of narrow down from there. What about getting full easily? That's, what? I think that, that would be related to the stomach. Okay, so what in his stomach? Um, the... The fact that it's not empty. Mm -hmm. It might not be emptying as much. Um, so yeah, so th there might be something in there mm. that, that's causing it, causing him to be more full easily. So something in the stomach, either he's not emptying it as much, there's not as much volume there. So yeah, good job. All right. So uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rascon, um, what about the weight loss? Why is that important? Mm. Not sure, but... 
not thinking of the weight loss. I mean, he's not eating and it could be due to maybe one of the organs that's being affected. Maybe he has like an infection or, um. Yes, that, that's a good point. So the, the, only, the only caveat to that is what you're saying is that he's been not eating for, or he's been losing weight for about a month, right? So if he, <laughs> if it was an infection, it's a pretty long time for him to have an infection. He would have some other symptoms and you know maybe he will that, that's good to keep in the back of, the, uh, of our, our mind um what else can cause weight loss um, i'm not sure but i guess people are saying cancer but yeah yeah so so dr muhammad's saying bulimia yeah you would want to consider bulimia um uh, but cancer, definitely. So how does cancer cause weight loss? Gosh. So what, first off, what is cancer? I mean, wouldn't it be, oh, sorry, I'm so nervous. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Don't, don't be, don't be nervous. So cancer is a, it's an abnormal growth of cells, right? So you have you have um, something that's growing there that's not supposed to, right? And mm -hmm. so these these cancer cells grow faster or slower than normal cells. They grow faster. They grow faster, right? So they're just wreaking havoc, causing destruction, um, and and growing out of control, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have somebody with cancer that that is, or so if you have cancer cells that are growing out of control. Are they going to require more energy or less energy than regular cells? More energy. More energy because they're, they're dividing like crazy. They're trying to grow as much as they can. So if I said this patient had a, a, um, had normal like appetite, he was eating normally, but he's still losing weight. It would it cause, uh, it would, it would be a sign of cancer because even though he is, uh, even though he's, uh, uh eating, normally it's not enough to sustain his body because all of those cancer cells are taking up the nutrients and growing and using them to grow and the, the rest of the body is being starved of those nutrients does that make sense yes it does so good so weight loss whenever somebody says i lost weight um um like 20 pounds in the last month you always want to think of cancer but what's some other things that can cause weight loss um just I mean, logically, like, what do, what do people try to do all the time? Try to work out or yeah. lower their calorie intake. Exactly. So that's a, it's a super, super, super important point. You have to ask, is this intentional? Were you trying to lose weight? Because if they're trying to lose weight, then you can't really bank on that being something like cancer. And so um, it's, it sounds very obvious, but we forget it a lot of the time, a lot of the time. So you have to ask is this intentional weight loss? And um, uh, for him, it was not. So we have to be thinking about something like cancer. Uh, there's other things that can cause weight loss, like hyperthyroidism. Um, uh, somebody mentioned inflammatory bowel disease because in, in inflammatory bowel disease, you're not really uh, processing those nutrients as well. Um, so those can also cause it, uh, but good job. Uh, all right, and then I said that he has difficulty swallowing food and water. So Dr. Clarissa, why is that important? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, so uh, I said that he has difficulty swallowing food and water. So why is that important to know? Mm -hmm. I guess you could probably go down, what is it like the esophagus? You could think about the stomach. Yeah, so, so good. So we're thinking about the esophagus. So the esophagus works by peristalsis. So basically, you swallow something. So if this is your esophagus right here. You swallow something, and the top of the esophagus, uh, so more prox, or I guess above it would be the best way to put it, squeezes and pushes it forward, squeezes and pushes it forward. And so there are two ways that it, you can have issues swallowing. So one, the nerves innervating the esophagus aren't working, and so you can't get that good squeeze. squeeze. But two... <laughs> If there is a, a mass there and you're squeezing as much as you can and you just can't get through it because something is blocking it, um, you can have difficulty swallowing food or water. Um, 
there's other reasons why as well, but those are the two big ones. And so if he, he did deny it, but I'm I just, I'm, I'm asking like, why is this important? Um, the fact that he's able to swallow food and water means that it's probably not the esophagus, right? So there's something other than the esophagus there. Cause the esophagus does go down into the abdominal cavity as it turns into the stomach. Um, so it's important to know. Uh, so good job. All right. So, um, Dr. Dr. Chan, um, he's been feeling progressive fatigue and over the last month has not been able to keep up with his daily routine. Um, why is that important? Um, <sighs> to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. It's okay. So that, it, that's good. So, um, we, it's important one, because we know that there's something going on, right? So if, if he had just upper abdominal pain, but it's not really affecting his everyday life and eh, maybe not so important, um, it's important, but it's not like dangerous or dire. As soon as it starts affecting your life, as soon as, as you're not able to do your daily activities and as soon as, you know, you can't even work anymore, it can, it, it, it it's, it's important to know and it makes your, your urgency a little bit higher. Um, so he, he works in construction and he's, had a difficult time getting through the rest of his day, has to rest every hour. He also admits to significant dizziness when he gets up too quickly, and it's made his work even more difficult. So um, out of all of that, what's going to be the most helpful to, in, in terms of, like, figuring out what's going on with him? Um, like he has to rest every hour and that he has significant dizziness? Yeah, so... The resting every hour is not normal, especially if he's a, a construction worker. You know, you know that something is really wrong um, in, in, for this patient. Um, but, the, but the dizziness for me was most important. Why is di the dizziness important? Um, like maybe there's no blood reaching the brain or... Um... Yeah. So, so you're right. You're, you're not getting enough blood or not, not enough oxygen to the brain. And a lot of times it's going to happen. So he's saying he gets really dizzy when he stands up too quickly. So have you guys, have you ever stood up too quickly and you start feeling dizzy or lightheaded? Yeah. So why does that happen? Um, is, it, is it just because like there's not, I'm not 100% sure, but like, could, yeah. it, could there just not be enough um, blood circulating or? Yeah, so what happens when you stand up? What, what, what is acting on your body as you stand up? Gravity? Gravity, yeah. So gravity is gonna pull all that blood. And so when you're sitting down like, we, like I am right now, my blood is kind of, um, it's, it's going down, but I'm not, uh, uh, most of it's not pulling up down to the bottom of my feet. But as soon as I stand up, all the blood in my veins are going to be pushed down because of gravity. And so um, if, you're, if your blood is going down because of gravity, it's not coming back up to your heart. So you're going to have less cardiac return to your heart, and your heart's not going to be able to push it as much. Usually your body will compensate by, squeeze, uh, by pumping faster because your cardiac output, what you're putting out of your heart and what your body wants to maintain at all costs, is a function of stroke volume and heart rate. So stroke volume times heart rate equals cardiac output. And so um, your cardiac output is basically what, we, what your body uses to determine um, your perfusion. And so if your volume goes down, your body's gonna wanna increase. So that's your stroke volume, how much you're squeezing out of your heart at one time, your heart rate is gonna go up to compensate for that, right? And so, um, so when we stand up, we don't get, you, we usually don't get dizzy unless we do it too quickly um, because our hearts will start beating a little bit faster to maintain that perfusion. So for him, he is having um, pretty significant dizziness. So that means that he might not have the volume to, um, to perfuse his body, even if he is starting to pump faster. So that's why it's, it's kind of important. So good job. Um, all right. So, um, Dr. Rory, um, he's been having back pain for the last two months, um, and, um, 
it's more notable on the left mid back and it's described as a deep ache and nothing is making it better. Um, so what are you thinking about with his back pain? Um, so I was thinking about like possibly his kidneys cause he was also having the upper abdominal pain. And in one of the videos, it was talking about how like upper abdominal can also be kidneys. And then he was also having pain in his back. So I thought maybe that it was connected. Yeah. So, cause your kidneys are kind of like right there, right. It, um, in that back area, a lot of times when the kidneys are affected, it'll cause some flank pain on the side, but you're, you're definitely right that back pain can indicate the kidneys. Um, and especially the, the mid back is where your kidneys are located. Um, so good. Um, he noticed blood in his urine, which he attributed to a UTI. He's had those symptoms in the past. He drank cram cranberry juice uh, for possible brewing infection. Um, so, so what are you thinking about there? Um, I think that only like adds to the fact that something is probably wrong with his kidneys um, because blood blood in the urine is like his kidneys however whatever's wrong like there's being blood that's draining with his urine as well yeah so blood in the urine is not normal right yeah. so what if you have a uti you can have blood right so if you pee blood the first thing we do is we we check the urine to see if there's, a, if there's an infection um but anywhere in that tract that of uh, the collection of urine down to where it drains can be affected. And part of that is your kidneys. So you're definitely right. Um, that there, it just indicates that. So there's something that can potentially be going on with the kidneys. So, um, and then the last thing that it says here is that his stools appeared dark and sticky over the last week. What does that mean? Um, I'm honestly not sure about that one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Um, all right. Let, uh, let's see. Dr. Steele. What does that mean? Sorry, my mic was off. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I was thinking it could be an upper GI bleed because, um, the the blood is dark or it could be blood so it might be a good idea to take a stool sample um and if it is blood it could probably be an upper gi bleed um if it is um since the blood had time to oxidize so yeah so so you if you have so um the blood has time to oxidize so but what um what's the best way to put it okay so you're you're when you when you have an upper GI bleed, what does it mix with? Why does it cause that oxidation? Why does it cause the blood to look black? Um, I'm not sure what it mixes with. Maybe uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, acid, right? So acid, in your stomach, okay. there's acid, so that breaks down the blood and, and it causes that black um, that black color. What if mm -hmm. instead of um, uh, instead of the black in the stool, uh, it, it came up in the vomit? How would it look? Um, how would it look? <laughs> so if he was throwing up blood, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and it had time to mix in the stomach and all that. What would it look like? Would it still be like dark and kind of chunky? No. It, it would look a little dark. It, it would look more like coffee grounds. Okay. Right? I was picturing so the, the uh, photo that you sent for the other case. Saying, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So it's like that dark, seedy type. Yeah. Uh, so that indicates an upper GI bleed, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so you're right, though. We have this dark, sticky stool um, that can uh, potentially be a bleed. So, what would you want to do on the physical exam? Um, it's a GI bleed because he is having uh, abdominal pain in there and in his back. So, um, would would lying down or leaning forward affect it at all? No. no. What's what's a good way to confirm if he has a, a GI bleed on a physical exam? Uh, oh, okay. You could do an endoscopy, right? You the can. Down that's, down. that's that's after the physical exam. So you're sitting in front of the patient. You're examining him. What can you do? Okay. 
I'm not sure. <laughs> so where does the stool come out? Oh, renal exam? Not a renal exam, a, a rectal exam, right? Rectal. Sorry, rectal. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so your poop is going to come out of, of your anus, right, from the rectum out. So yeah. you, you stick a finger in there, you get a stool sample, you put it on a card and put a little solution on it. If it turns bright mm. blue, that means that there's blood there. So, right. so yeah, you're right. We would do a rectal okay. exam and see. Good job. Mm. Um, all right. So he denies fevers, chills, night sweats, vomiting, bright red blood in the stool, constipation, diarrhea, reflux symptoms, chest pain, shortness of breath. So Dr. Chowdhury, um, any of that super important? All right, so uh, Dr. Yusuf, any of that super important? Okay, so the only thing that's important in there really is the fevers and the chills. Just means that there's probably not um, an infection. Uh, the bright red blood in the stool is also kind of important uh, because why, Dr. Dow, why, why is that important? Anybody, why is that important? Um, I know it's important because it's not, it means it's not coming from the lower part of the um, bowel. Yeah, good. So it's probably not a lower GI bleed, right? So um, that, that helps us kind of distinguish. It's not 100% because if you have a brisk upper GI bleed and it's just flowing through your, your, um, your GI tract super quick, it can still look red. Um, so, but those are really, those are really dangerous GI bleeds. If it, if it's an upper GI and it's just flowing really quickly because that patient is losing volume quickly. So, but that's important to know that it's not bright red. All right. Anything, uh, uh, Dr. Marani, um, anything in the history that it is also important that you, you found important to ask about? Um, I kind of thought it was important that he smokes a lot and then tried cocaine and marijuana because that can affect your kidneys and your liver. And I know that with end stage kidney disease or kidney like failure in general, like it also affects your lungs. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So, so that, that can, um, so the cocaine and the marijuana are important. He hasn't used it in a while. So maybe not so much, but the smoking history is definitely important because, uh, he definitely, uh, 30 pack years of smoking is pretty significant. So, um, what about the, the drinking two to three times a, two to three times a week? Is that important? Um, is that a lot? Um, I don't, I don't think that's a lot, but it might be still important to know. Yeah. It's going to be important to know, especially if he's had a history of, um, drinking a lot more in the past. What about his medications? Um, um, is lisinopril <clears throat> one for like high blood pressure? Yeah, so it's a blood pressure medication. So why is it important to know about his blood pressure medication? So that would mean that he usually has high blood pressure if he isn't taking like that medicine. Yeah, so it might be that he, he has high blood pressure at baseline. Um, what if, what, if what, would, what would happen if he took too much of it? Um, then in blood, then his blood pressure would be too low. And I know that could also account for like having dizziness if you're standing or moving. Exactly. Exactly. So that can be a cause of his dizziness. So I think the number three reason why people uh, are injured or, or, or die in this country are because of medication errors or, or, or yeah, um, um, iatrogenic. So things that doctors do to patients, not out of any malice or anything like that. They're just mistakes that happen. And so um, you should always look at, you know, the procedures that we're doing. Uh, you should look at the medications we're doing uh, and uh, that are being given to the patient. See if that can potentially cause some type of issue um, that are, is related to their presentation. So yeah, lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide, their blood pressure medications, you take too much of it, they can feel fatigued. Good. Um, 
Good job. Uh, Dr. Jasmine. Uh, so the vitals show a blood pressure of 110 over 66, a heart rate of 110, uh, respiratory rate of 16, temp of 99, and O2 sat 96 on room air. Anything in there stand out to you? Um, I think just the heart rate of 110 um, stands out. That means he's tachycardic. Yeah, yeah. So um, what can cause tachycardia? Um, I was just thinking that he had anemia, and that was when I Googled it, it like was a symptom. Yeah, so if he has anemia, it can cause tachycardia. Why would it cause tachycardia? Um, low blood. Low, you mean like low blood pressure? Oh, yes. Or That's like low, low blood volume in general? Um, low blood volume. Yeah, so, so if you have anemia, that means that you don't have the red blood cells, you don't have the hemoglobin there that is going to um, help you perfuse your brain and all that. So a lot of times if you're having an acute bleed, you, um, you're volume is going to go down. So like we talked about before, cardiac output equals stroke rate, um, stroke volume times heart rate. And so if your volume is lower, your heart rate is going to go up to compensate. So that can actually be going on in this patient. What about the blood pressure? Is that a normal blood pressure? I don't think so. That's a trick question. It is a normal blood pressure, but why might that not be normal for him? Mm, I'm not too sure. What, what does he have a history of? Hypertension. Hypertension, yeah. So he's a history of hypertension, which means that his blood pressure is usually up. We are treating it. So this might be around his baseline, but it's going to be important to know what his baseline is to see if this is lower than he normally is. Because if he's lower, then that means his volume is low enough and his body's not able to compensate, and so he's going to be more at risk of, you know, something bad going on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good job. Um, okay. So, Dr. Hodge, um, anything in the physical exam? What, what are you gonna, what's the first thing you're going to do for the physical exam? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? What, what's the first thing that you want to do in the physical exam? Um, probably do, like, check the, uh, abdominal area, like, pr press on it to mm -hmm. see if he feels tenderness or anything. Yeah, so we can do an abdominal exam. What I typically do is, what Dr. Isabel saying, look and see if they're in distress. Like, so, as soon as, and this is kind of, like, probably a no-brainer, um, but what, what I want you guys to do first when you look through these cases is to see the general exam. How do they look? Are they in distress? Do they look sick? Do they not? Um, because uh, getting the overall gestalt of that patient is important um, to decide, do you need to inter intervene right now? Or do you have some time to kind of dissect what's going on? Um, but, but yeah, um, good. So the general exam is he, he basically just looks underweight, but he's overall well-groomed, pleasant, um, doesn't look like he's in any distress. So going to the abdominal exam, uh, tender to palpation in the epigastric region, so that's the that upper um, part of the abdomen, no rebound or guarding, bowel sounds in all four quadrants, no super pubic tenderness. So um, what's important in there? Um, it's important that he explains that he does feel pain when you touch the upper central region of the abdomen. Um, and the rebounding and guarding, um, so that means when I looked it up, it says that the muscles weren't like tensing back up in response to being pushed. So I was thinking maybe that means like it's not necessarily inflammation or anything, um, but I'm not yes. 100% yeah. sure. Yeah, so rebound and guarding are, are signs of in inflammation within the abdomen. So rebound is when we push in and we let go, that that causes kind of like, the way that I think of it is like a, 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 a wave of movement within the abdomen. And so if there's any tenderness in the abdomen because you have some leakage of contents irritating the the peritoneum so that lining around your organs um it'll cause rebound so you're pushing down you let go it causes pain somewhere else um and it's more pain when you let go than when you push in that tells us that there's inflammation 
um, outside of an organ. And that's important to know because that can be a sign of a surgical abdomen. Um, and then the guarding is, is the way that I think of it is um, your body trying to protect itself. So the, there's inflammation and irritation that causes contraction in the muscles. And so when you push down that, that uh, it feels like the, the muscles are tensing up against you. And a lot of times you push down and their abdomen feels like rock hard and solid. And that's a bad sign. That patient is going to need to probably go um, and have surgery consulted to evaluate him more. Um, so it, good. It, it makes it seem like there's, it's less of a uh, surgical abdomen at this point. Bowel sounds in all four quadrants are important to know because that just means that the bowels are moving like they're supposed to um, and no suprapubic tenderness. So what does that mean? Um, I think it's, it means that there's no pain around his like bladder or intestines, like kind of the lower um, abdominal area. Um, and it's probably not like anything with the genitals either or the pubic bone. Yeah. So the, the biggest one is the bladder. So if you have a bladder infection and we push down in that area and it causes tenderness, that, that tells us that it might be the bladder. You might have a bladder infection. Um, but yeah, good job. Um, so Dr. Dr. Isabel, um, anything else that you want to get in terms of um, physical exam? Um, I was thinking maybe... Um, to hold on, I have my notes here. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask if he has any pain when urinating. Okay, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, he did not, um, but that's a really good question. Um, what else in the physical exam do you want to do? So you're you're sitting in front of him. You're going to examine him. What examinations do you want to do, or what systems? I would want to examine. Um, his neurological system, especially since he had dizziness, just to make sure that it's nothing going on um, there. Good, good. So it was normal, but that's a that's a very good point because you, you want to make sure that he doesn't have um, he's not like a stroke or he doesn't have anything else that you know could be causing the dizziness um, neurologically. Good. What about the back? He has CVA tenderness in the uh, on the left. What does that mean? Um, that kind of indicates a potential kidney issue. Um, yeah. So what is CVA tenderness? What are you doing when you check CVA tenderness? I mean, from my understanding, you're sort of palpating that area um, to see if he feels any pain there. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit more than palpation. So what, what I do is I put my hand on their back and then I just, I tap it. I, I actually like hit it like that. And so if there's irritation of the kidney, they will jump up. So if they have like a kidney infection, that would be very painful. They'll jump up and say that really hurts. Um, same thing if they had like a kidney stone. If it causes mild tenderness, you can have some musculoskeletal issues. You can also have some kidney issues there too, but it's not that profound inflammation. So good. So he does have some tenderness in, in that area. Um, what about um, his tachycardia and his cap refill? What does that mean? Um, I'm not sure about the cap refill, but the tachycardia, um, uh, like we were saying before, indicates that his heart is having trouble uh, pumping the blood. Maybe not because of a heart issue, but because his cardiovascular system, for some reason, isn't being able to carry the blood where it needs to go. Yeah. And so the cap refill of three seconds can be considered normal-ish, but it's like the high, high end of normal. Um, and so for me, three seconds is a little delayed. Um, and so, um, for a lot of these things, it, it's, it, they sit on a continuum. And so cap refill of three seconds, I would say I'd be thinking that there's some potential, uh, perfusion issues. And so I would, I would keep an eye on, uh, I keep an eye on that and see if, uh, I want to make sure that we give something like fluids to, uh, bring up his volume, um, to make sure he's perfusing well. Um, good. Anything else that you want to do on physical exam? We kind of talked about it earlier. Um, I can't really think of anything. Okay. Um, so he, he's fatigued. He has dizziness. Um, uh, he had, uh, th this dark stool. What do you want to do? Um, I would want to... As far as the fatigue, I'd want to probably um, 
I know it mentioned that his, uh, the H-E-E-N-T, uh, head, ears, nose, and throat, um, was normal, but I'd want to, um, if I was the one doing this physical, physical exam, I would check for tenderness in his neck just to make sure that the fatigue wasn't caused by something in the neck. Um, yeah, like, like, um, like th thyroid issues. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, uh, but what about like the dark stool? What, how are you going to check that? Um, I know we were talking about a rectal exam. Yeah, so we're going to do a rectal exam. And so his rectal exam was, um, was positive. And so he has... He has blood in his stool. So they, they took a sample. They got that guaiac positive stool, uh, meaning that there's some blood in it. Good. Good job. Um, Dr. Dr. Khan, what labs do you want? Let's go with Dr. Samuels. What, what labs do you want? Um, would, could it be like in addition to the labs that like are already on the case? Well, yeah, you can, you can um, ask for any additional labs other than that or the ones that are on the case. Oh, like, okay. Yeah. Like um, what's important. Then definitely like the urine dipstick, um, because there was blood in the urine, I think. Um, and then, uh, a BMP. Okay. So, so blood in the urine. Um, so there, so we checked the urine, there was some blood in there. Um, sometimes with like muscle injuries, you can have like myoglobin in the blood that in the urine that can come up positive as blood, but it's not really blood. Uh, uh, so you'd want to, you'd want to, uh, do a confirmatory urinalysis, but that's a, that's a really good point that there's blood in there. We didn't have a UA here, but we're going to assume that it's just blood. Okay. Uh, and then what about the specific gravity? Is that normal? Um, honestly, I'm not sure. It might okay. be. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's on the, it's high. So that means, uh, okay. what does that mean? Um, I, I don't know. Okay. So, um, so the specific gravity is basically how concentrated your urine is. So if it, it's, uh, 1.03 is technically on the high side of normal, but honestly, it's pretty high to me. Um, so that means that his urine is pretty concentrated, which means that he might be dehydrated. Oh, uh, Okay. So, so yeah, so that, that's one thing. The fact that his urine's otherwise normal um, is important. Why? Um, because it shows that there wouldn't be a UTI. Yeah, so there's, it doesn't look like there's any other signs of the UTI. Blood is a sign of UTI, so you want to get that UA, but um, okay. the, the rest, uh, being normal, we can assume that he doesn't really have a UTI. Good. Um, and then what else did you say you wanted to get? A BMP. Okay, so the BMP is, um, it looks... Mostly normal, but the BUN is 40, the creatinine is 1.8, the baseline is 0.7. So mm -hmm. why is that? Uh, why is that important to know? What does that tell you? Um, let me grab my notes. Um, it would. Sorry, I'm just going through. It's okay. Okay. So the, the baseline is 0.7 and then the creatinine is 1.8. So okay. what does that tell you right um, that? It can indicate a kidney injury if mm -hmm. elevated. Yeah, so it's elevated from his baseline. So there's some type yeah. of kidney injury. So okay. the way that I think of kidney injuries, there's three different causes of kidney injury. One is pre-renal, so before the kidney. So that has to do with the amount of blood going to the kidney itself. If there's decreased blood flow to the kidney, it can cause injury. Intrinsic renal means that there's something wrong with the kidney itself. So a lot of times it's because of the medications, because of the contrast that we use in a CT scan. It's, um, it can be, um, those are the two big ones, and I'm blanking on the other causes. But like acute tubular ne necrosis, um, yeah, not important for this discussion. Um, and then the, the, the last type is... Uh, is post-renal, meaning after the kidney. So if there's an obstruction where the urine flows out, it's causing backup that can injure the kidney as well. So for him, knowing what we know, that his heart rate is high, his specific gravity is high, um, what, what is most likely in him? 
Like, what's the most likely issue with There's, this kidney? I feel like there might be like a kidney infection or something like along those lines. So or something wrong less with likely it. infection. Yeah, it's less likely infection because the uh, the uh, urine was clean. But um, oh yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. So if if um, if we're saying that he's tachycardic, his specific gravity is high, meaning he's dehydrated. Those three different causes of kidney issues. What is the most likely cause? Um, you could have um like. So is it going to be before the kidney, at it the would kidney be, level it would itself? Pre renal. Pre renal, yeah. So yeah. So there's not enough blood flow. He's already dehydrated. Yeah. He's tachycardic. Um, he shows signs of hypovolemia. So your volume being low. So probably pre renal. Good job. Um, good. Uh, Doctor Doctor Muhammad. Um, what about the BUN? Uh, I think, like, because the BUN is high, doesn't that indicate, like, again, there's something wrong with the kidneys, like, they're not filtering the blood? And then you also mentioned, like, since it might be a pre-renal problem, there's already not enough blood going to the kidney, so that could, like, contribute to the problem. Yeah, so, so BUN is an end product of protein metabolism um, when it's uh, excreted by the kidney. And so um, when you have something like the GI bleed, you can have an increase in those, that protein, those proteins in your blood because they're getting reabsorbed um, um, from the GI tract uh, as the blood is broken down. And so, so we in the past we've used the UN indicator. So if you have a ratio of the UN being greater than twenty to one, that can indicate a GI bleed. So that's another uh, thing that you can be thinking about um, because his ratio, I believe, is above twenty to one. Um, but, but yes, you're right. That BUN is another indicator of a, of, of a kidney. Any other labs you want to get? Uh, nothing I can think of off the top of my head. Okay, I think we missed probably the most important one. Is it is it given, like or? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's we haven't talked about it yet. It's given in the case. Okay. Uh, like another thing, like in the labs included, looking at the CBC, I think his uh, hemoglobin is low, which would indicate like anemia or something. Yeah. So his his CBC is in his CBC, his hemoglobin super low. So his hemoglobin seven point two. So you're right. So it, it can indicate anemia. Um, and so uh, with everything, the whole picture uh, going on, what is it? What is it that you think is going on? Uh, honestly, I'm kind of like, if, if, cause it feels like the case is going in many different ways. I'm leaning more toward like a kidney problem just okay. because, uh, a lot of the symptoms were leaning that way, but yeah. I'm, I'm not really that sure. Yeah. So whenever, whenever we're confused about what's going on in this case, and that's why I chose this case specifically for a practice case. So you can see all the different things that can be going on in the abdomen. Um, so when you get confused, summarize what you have. So we have a 56-year-old guy coming in with abdominal pain, signs of a GI bleed, and signs of a kidney. So he has, um, so he has something wrong with the kidney, and he has something wrong with the GI. He's having trouble eating because he's feeling full. So that indicates maybe most likely what what more things with the GI. Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, so he he's he's saying that he feels full when he eats. So what's more likely within that GI system to be causing that bleeding? Is it if he's feeling full? Is it in in a upper GI bleed? Upper GI bleed. Where specifically? Where do we feel fullness? Like, why is it that we feel full after we eat? Our stomach. Your stomach. So there's something wrong with the stomach. So mm -hmm. if you were to guess, let's say his kidneys were were uh, were having an issue, which kidney would it be? Sorry, I, I think the audio is going in and out for me. Could you repeat that again? Yeah, hold on. Let me let me check real quick. Is it is it still going in and out? Okay, yeah, I think it's good now. Okay. 
so if there was if there was something um, wrong with the stomach, we're saying there's something that might be wrong with the stomach and the kidney. Mm-hmm. Which kidney do you think would be the problem? The right or the left? The right. Left. Right. Wait. Left. Right. Left. Left. <laughs> so yeah. So what side is your stomach on? On left side. Left side. On the left side, exactly. So, so good. So, what do you want to get to to see what's going on? Uh, maybe some sort of imaging. Okay, good. Um, what imaging? I think a CT or good. soft tissue. Good. So, um, Doctor Imran. Um, we're going to get a CT on this patient. Um, what, what type of CT are you going to get? Are you going to get it with contrast or without contrast? I'm not really sure, but, um, with contrast? So contrast you're going to use if you're thinking of a malignancy or an infection in general, right? Why can't we use contrast in this patient? Um, I'm not sure. It's um, not infection. What was that? Is it because it's not inf- infection? Um, potentially, but we're also we're also thinking uh, it can possibly be a malignancy. So why wouldn't we do contrast in this patient? Let's go with uh, Dr. Shreya. Why aren't we going to use contrast in this patient? Um, you have to look for kidney function with contrast because that can affect the kidneys. So you know kidneys are already not working well, so you can't use contrast. Exactly. So so we can't use contrast because her kidney function is low. So um, she got a CT. He got a CT abdomen, chest, abdomen, pelvis without contrast. And so this, the the reach said um, limited due to the lack of contrast, but he had a three centimeter mass in the antral portion of the stomach. So in the stomach on that lower part near the uh, near where it goes into uh, the duodenum, there was a three centimeter mass. Um, additionally, there was a 5.5 centimeter irregular solid structure in the superior pole of the left kidney. So there's another mass in the kidney. Um, and the, the mass in the kidney is a bit bigger. And so we were right on that left side, there was something going on. So uh, let's, let's go back to uh, Dr. Imran. Um, what do you want to do next? Um, well, I think because there's a mass, it could either be a tumor or um, some kind of obstruction, like okay. a kidney stone. So how are you going to evaluate that? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, so if you're thinking that it can be a tumor, how do we usually diagnose tumors? Um, a biopsy. A biopsy, perfect. So how do you want to biopsy it? And which one do you want to biopsy, first of all? The stomach or the kidney? Um, the kidney. Why the kidney? Um, because I think it also could be a... I don't know. So typically, we, we want to try to get the, the primary cancer, right? So the... the The mass in the kidney is 5.5 centimeters, so it's bigger. So it's most likely the the primary, although that doesn't hold true all the time. However, um, Dr. Lara is saying it's easier for the kidney. It actually, it it can be depending on the location, but it's actually easier for the stomach because we can we can do an EGD. So we get a camera, put it down the throat, and um, take a look and see where that potential bleeding is. And the EGD is better because it can be therapeutic as well. Because if the bleeding is coming from that mass, then you can you can clot it off. You can you can um, burn it where it's bleeding and stop the bleeding itself, and take a, si- a a snip of that mass there. And so that's what they did. They got an EGD and it showed an ulcerated mass in the antrum of the stomach with notable oozing. Biopsy was taken and argon plasma coagulation used for homo- hemostasis. So. They, they, they looked in with the camera, they looked down, they saw that there was a mass there, they saw some oozing there. So um, they took a sample, they clotted it off and, um, and sent it to pathology. So um, what do we, 
uh, Dr. Dr. Um, actually, who is the other person? It's Dr. Shreya. Um, for this patient, are we going to keep him in the hospital while we wait for uh, results? Um, I think because of his kidney function and because he seems dehydrated, it might be a good idea to like give him IV fluids and things like that for the meantime, but maybe not for several days. Yeah, so exactly right. So we're going to admit him, make sure he's hydrated. He's pretty anemic. So what do, you, what do we want to do for him? Um, blood transfusion. Exactly. Or, okay. Yeah. So we're gonna give we're gonna give blood. So we gave him three units of packed red blood cells. So just uh, three units of blood, and we discharged him after the EGD. We didn't wait for the the results to come back because sometimes it can take a while, and being in the hospital increases your risk for infection and other stuff too. So, um, so yeah. So, so what are we thinking is most likely for this patient with that biopsy? Likely a tumor. Yeah. So most likely cancer. Okay. So, so, um, Dr. Dr. Chitwan, what do you think is the most likely, um, source of the cancer? Do you think it's the stomach or the kidney? Hmm. Uh, I mean, I kind of think it's the kidney just because of the fact that, um, A, the mass on the kidney is bigger and B, uh, and also like also taking into the fact that it's not always like that. The bigger mass is not always the cancerous one, but also the fact that a lot of the symptoms in my opinion are kind of more, um, can more related to the kidney with the back pain, the bloody urine and uh, whatnot. So I think that could, I think that it could be kidney cancer, but you know, I'm not entirely yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah it, it can honestly go any way. Um, so with, with this patient, um, this patient, her, his biopsy result came back as clear cell um, renal cell carcinoma that was metastatic to the stomach. So they took the biopsy sample of the stomach and they found out that it was kidney cells, basically kidney cancer. And so that, that, that renal cell metastasized to the stomach. And so renal cell carcinoma, a lot of the time is silent. So you're going to have, um, you're going to have, um, growth of that mass without really knowing. And so he had growth of the mass probably because of his smoking history that put him at risk for this cancer um, that eventually metastasized. And he didn't really start getting symptoms and noticing it until he, um, he started having the GI symptoms and bleeding from the GI system. It's not clear whether or not the, the last time he was bleeding from the urine was actually a UTI because I, I believe he did have a, um, he did have an infection at that time, but it, you know, he might have an infection plus the bleeding from uh, early cancer. But a lot of times if it gets better, it's most likely an infection because the cancer will keep growing. It's not going to get better on its own. Um, as far as the stage, it's, uh, I believe it would be stage four because it's, it's metastatic. It's pretty much everywhere. I don't know what the TNM staging would be. I'd have to, um, I'd have to actually think of it. I'm not an oncologist, so I'd have to actually look at it. Um, uh, Dr. Khan is asking, would it be worth it to check other organs? Definitely. So we already got a CT chest abdomen pelvis, but it's without contrast. What I would do is I'd hydrate him, make sure his kidneys get better and, um, probably do a CT, um, brain, chest, abdomen, pelvis, uh, again for, uh, uh, with contrast to evaluate for more masses. Um, cause that will dictate what, uh, what treatment he gets. Um, so he was referred to Hemonc and started on one of the monoclonal antibody therapies. Um, I, I didn't write it down here, um, and, but it, it's one of the newer the newer medications. And he required multiple hospitalizations for the GI bleed and to control the bleeding from the abdominal mass. And he required multiple transfusions as well. Um, I I have to look back and see what the outcome of the case was. Um, uh, but um, but yeah, so. The, the point of this case was to see um, how how difficult it could be to to work with abdominal pain and to to diagnose it. It can be anything from just gastritis with that upper abdominal pain to something like a cancer. So it's it's pretty hard to to distinguish, um, and so you have to look at all of those other all the other signs and symptoms. But I wanted you 
you to do this case because it wasn't as straightforward and I was going to be able to, um, to guide you through it. Um, so, so yeah. So questions, um, would his previous UTI have left him prone to cancer? Not so much. It would be, um, it would be more if it's recurrent over a long period of time, but it would, it wouldn't necessarily be kidney cancer, maybe be bladder cancer. And a PET scan would be helpful for METs as well. If you're looking at like the metabolism, but the problem with the PET scan, is very expensive and, um, and the CT scan can, for the most part, do that. You would only use a PET scan if you're going to change management. Um, the WBC does matter, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't really elevated. It doesn't really show that there's an infection, so um, it's not super important uh, this, this, this time. Um, we got rid of a possible infection because of the specific gravity. No, um, we got an infection because the rest of the UA was normal. So there wasn't any leukocyte esterase. There was no nitrites. Um, and then if you did a UA... Um, and you look to see if there was bacteria there, you, you, you wouldn't have seen any. Um, you would look for swollen lymph nodes in the area because it does metastasize. So you would check for lymph nodes up top and in the armpits as well. Um, all right, guys, I have to stay on time today. So if you have more questions, let me know. I will, um, I will probably send out a, um, a message to you all to see if you guys want to talk about the case a little bit more. Um, but I have to make sure I get to that graduation. So um, I appreciate all of your, your time here. Uh, Dr. Wendy's asking if the light pace matters in this case, it was normal. So it doesn't really matter. Just tells us it's not the pancreas. Um, so, so yeah, um, let me know what questions you have and I will talk to you soon. All right. Thanks guys. Bye. Thank you.